Hey guys, and welcome to Scientific Drinking. Uh, tonight we're talking about NASA's SLS, or Space Launch System. So you can't talk about SLS unless you talk about the Constellation Program. Constellation Program got started around 2005. It was in response to uh, George Bush's request for the vision for space exploration, which started in 2004, like I said, manifest around 2005, and you come up with the Constellation Program. About $240 million was expected over the course of the next 20 years uh, to be allocated to this new vision to colonize the moon, get this big rocket up and going, and start working on a mission to Mars. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's a lot like the Artemis program. And in fact, it's pretty much the same thing. It's the same idea. You know, going on to Mars is definitely not a new idea. So like I said, it's about $240 million was allocated to this vision for space exploration in 2004. To give you an idea, that is about an additional $12 billion a year for NASA. NASA's budget is and has been for the past you know, several decades about one half of 1% of the federal budget. That's about $16 billion. So this is almost double NASA's budget, at least proposed. It didn't manifest that way, but that was the idea. An additional amount of funding was granted to NASA to develop uh, what was called the Ares-1 and Ares-5 rockets. The Ares-1 was pretty much a space shuttle booster with a capsule on top. The Ares-5 was the space shuttle core stage with a couple of boosters on the side and just everything was just made taller. If that sounds familiar, that's the SLS. These concepts were around, like I said, in 2005, the contract was awarded to Boeing and it was allocated $10 billion was gonna go to you know, building this rocket. And from the start, there was problems. What you're trying to do is continue the infrastructure, designs, and architecture from the space shuttle that's already there. And the idea is that you can save money. Listen, these parts are already there. Let's just slap them on a new rocket and we're done but it didn't work out that way. And it's, it's never worked out that way. It's, it's not an optimal rocket. It is a super heavy lift rocket, and so was Ares-5. Talking more about Ares-5, so this went on for a while. We started working with the Ares-1. Now, if you ever heard or listened to a launch of the space shuttle or the launch of other rockets, liquid rockets are relatively smooth sounding. They're a big constant rumble. The solid rocket boosters are kind of like ripping of cardboard. It's, it's this big kind of crackling sound that rumbles through the air. And that's because the consistency of the solid rocket motors aren't as uniform as a liquid is. It just can't be, right? So there's a lot, that, that crackling is a lot of vibration. And when you're in the space shuttle, isolated through a connection to the, to the main core, which is then isolated from the boosters, that vibration kind of gets damped out through all these connections. But if you're just sitting right on top of that, that solid booster, you're getting shaken to shit. <laughs> and so that's pretty much what happened. They did launch the Ares-1 once, and they found that the vibration was way too much for a manned mission. It would have shaken the crew apart. Now, we're NASA, right? We can solve these problems, uh, but it didn't last that long. In 2010, uh, the Obama administration pulled the plug on the Constellation program, and that was the end of the Ares-1 but not quite the end of the Ares-5. As we know, it manifested in the form of the SLS. And that happened the next year, 2011, when Congress came through and said, hey, we really need this super heavy lift rocket to continue our exploration of the moon and Mars. So they came back with this plan saying, hey, let's do $10 billion for the SLS, uh, another $6 billion for Orion, and a couple billion dollars for ground support. And that was $18 billion over the course of six years. Not that big a deal, relatively speaking. You know, DOD gets $610 billion, at least this year. That's 25% of GDP. In 2017 was when this program was supposed to first launch, and they ordered two core stages from Boeing, who got awarded the contract the next year in 2012. Fast forward, we go through all this process of trying to build a rocket, and you get to 2017, and this rocket is still far from done. The Office of the Inspector General gets gets involved and they do this investigation to find out what's going on. Why is this taking so long? Uh, why is this taking up so much money? They found, and I quote, we found most of the schedule delays were the result of the variety of interrelated management, technical and infrastructure issues traceable to the company, the company being Boeing. But Boeing isn't the only one to blame here. In addition to Boeing's poor performance, we found a number of unacceptable procurement practices by NASA officials at Marshall that added to contract cost and schedule issues. Most of it was Boeing, um, but NASA is, is definitely not completely void of blame here. Uh, and, and that's evidenced in some of the lack of transparency. In, in fact, the Government Accountability Office 
had said that some of the major issues with NASA was the lack of transparency for uh, Boeing or Boeing's SLS and the Orion capsule. And that's not too surprising, right? When NASA was asked, how much is it going to take to launch one of these rockets? Just one rocket launch. How much is one of these rockets going to cost? And it turns out that no one could really answer that question. Um, estimates earlier in 2011, 2012 kind of placed the ballpark at $534 billion or so. Now that has ballooned since then to about $1 billion per rocket launch as expected for the Artemis program, which is huge. I mean, granted, this is a massive rocket. Let's, let's be perfectly clear. This is a huge rocket. It's comparable to the Saturn V, but it has more thrust output. It can lift more than the Saturn V in its full configuration. Big rockets are expensive. Doing something new is expensive. But as of this year, the SLS has cost the taxpayers $20 billion. That is double the initial cost estimate. Although other programs are over budget, uh, and notably the Orion program and the ground support equipment required, ground support equipment, as we saw in last video, is undergoing testing at the pad right now. It's assembled, it's done, it's ready to go. Orion is assembled, made it to the European service module, ready for final testing at Glenn Space Center this year. It's all ready to go except for the core stage, except for this. And you would think that using all of the space shuttle parts would make this pretty easy, right? You're just reconfiguring some old parts. And that's really what it seems like. Let's digress a moment. Let's talk about Artemis. The budget for Artemis is 20 to $30 billion up until 2024 to put people on the moon. None of this has been approved yet. None of this has been approved or passed through Congress as of the time of recording this video. So we're asking for another 20 to $30 billion drop, it, you know, drop in the bucket. Uh, in terms of government spending. Take a break here. And with this schedule to put boots on the moon in 2024, there's a sense of urgency, right? The president wanted uh, SLS to be launched for Artemis 1 in middle 2020. This would be look great for his campaign, right? So we get a rocket launch, look, we're, we're putting boots on the moon. It became very clear pretty quickly to both the White House and to Jim Bridenstine, the administrator of NASA, that this probably isn't gonna happen. This has been cost overrun after cost overrun, delay after delay. Um, so it wasn't too surprising when that wasn't gonna happen. One of the alternatives proposed was to, to use commercial rockets to do this. And this is putting uh, the Orion capsule and European service module on one mission and the booster on another, pushing them both into space and mating them. And you have to launch at pretty much the same time, which is an interesting caveat. We've never done that before. Mating them in space, which is also interesting. We've never made it a booster to a spacecraft in space before, not in this configuration. And then doing the lap around the moon in that, in that configuration. Possible. Yeah, we're NASA. Pretty much anything is possible for NASA, right? But it's a question of risk. Now we'll talk about risk in another episode. This was quite a, a hurried plan. And even the issue of manufacturing the hardware required for this autonomous docking of what is pretty much a Centaur upper stage and Orion and the European service module is quite considerable. Let's talk about launch capabilities. How much can these rockets launch? As you can see from this graphic, the SLS weighs in at 95 metric tons, and that's comparable to the Starliner and the new Glenn, both at 100 metric tons. Now the stage 2B, of SLS is 130 metric tons. Now, these are all super heavy lift rockets. None of them exist this day. The only thing that has launched so far is that Saturn V. Other capabilities are the Falcon Heavy, weighing in at 64 metric tons, the Atlas V, 18 metric tons, and the Delta IV Heavy, 28 metric tons. The Vulcan, of course, hasn't launched yet, also 35 metric tons. These are all heavy lift vehicles and capable launch vehicles that have proven themselves, especially the Falcon Heavy in recent times. None of these have the same lift capability and none of these can reach the moon. What is so hard about SLS? What is so difficult about getting SLS out the door? One, it's a matter of political choices, right? I talked about $20 billion allocated to SLS. That's not including development cost for the Ares 5, which is its doppelganger. That's, that's a lot of money over the past decade, decade and a half. By the time it's launched, it's gonna be nearly 20 years that we've been developing this rocket. So with aircraft taking about 10 years, you would think a rocket is this spacecraft, right? It's the next level. But really a rocket isn't that complicated. I mean, it's, it's still a rocket, you know, it's still rocket science. But when compared to a fighter aircraft, the level of complexity is comparable. It's just the size that's the issue. And when you have that much investment into a single asset, it has to be right. If you're going to launch one single launch vehicle, it has to work. 
Uh, it's not like the Falcon 9 where you can launch a few of them and blow them up. Now, I, I know Elon was pretty close to ruin before that launch, last one launched, but uh, you, you see my point. The amount of expense required for a Falcon 9 compared to something like the SLS is a whole different ball game, a whole nother order of magnitude. The second aspect of what makes SLS so difficult is politics, and that's what makes NASA difficult, right? All the missions that NASA would love to do requires the support of the taxpayers, requires the support of Congress. Without that support, we can't get anything off the ground. As you heard in this, this little conversation we've had, the changes in administration from every four to eight years can wreak havoc on the plans that NASA has laid out. While Bush had this vision of putting people on the moon and going further, uh, Obama didn't share that, that same sight. This isn't taking political sides or anything, this is just stating the nature of the beast. Without a consistent message for these multi-year programs, they are doomed to fail, or they're doomed to struggle at the very least. And SLS is an example of that struggle at the whim of political needs, desires, and changing influences. You see, this is what politics does to a man, even just talking about it. So to cap things off, the SLS has been subject to mismanagement, has been subject to uh, mysterious cost overruns, has been subject to changing of political tides. And add on top of that, it is rocket science. It's difficult to launch a rocket and do it successfully. So I hope that's brought you up to speed with SLS. We're hoping that it launches next year. I'm sure lots of people are hoping that it launches the next year. It would be a truly magnificent sight to see this thing fly. So join us next time on Scientific Green. We're gonna to talk to you about how to get an internship at NASA. Cheers.